Hello and welcome to The Dish. I'm Aaron Kenigsberg, and if you're only just joining us, too bad. This is our last episode of the season, and we've had a lot of fun. It's been a roller coaster of emotion, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'll miss you guys. All of you. I will. I will. And I just have to say one thing. I've never seen an episode of Breaking Bad. I said it. I said it. The deed is done, and welcome to The Dish. Batman vs. Superman, the Marvel DC mashup no one asked for, was released last week and its reviews have been terrible. The movie has a whopping 29% on Rotten Tomatoes and is getting slammed by critics and audiences alike. And at this point, people are just going to the movie to laugh at it. People are saying that the best part of the movie is Ben Sadfleck's portrayal of Batman. If the best part of a movie is Ben Affleck, you know it's a little rough. <laughs> but, but hey, hey, at least this means his Batman reboot might be pretty good. I mean, it's immediately following the best Batman trilogy ever, so uh, no pressure, Ben. Let me tell you something, brother. Hulk Hogan was just awarded a $115 million settlement against Gawker for posting his sex tape without permission. And the, might, the fight might not be over yet. That $115 million was just for economic and emotional damages. The jury can still reverse Frankenstein. <laughs> I'm sorry, looking up wrestling moves for this piece was crazy fun. The jury can still moonsault set and bomb Gawker with yet more fines. Denton claimed that the pictures are essential to communicating to today's audiences, citing the fall of the Berlin Wall as an example of how imagery could define a news story. <laughs> Journalists. The Pentagon Papers was an essential news story. The Watergate scandal needed to be told. But I don't think our democracy's need for an informed public really justifies plastering Hogan's little Andre the Giant over the cyberspace. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we'll have Boston Magazine reporter Matt Jewell here to tell us some entertainment news from, from around Boston. Stay tuned. to host Good Morning Emerson, of course. Good Morning Emerson? What's that? Uh, it's the best morning show ever that's on Tuesday and Thursday at 9 a.m. Wow, how, can I work on this? Yeah, let's get going. <laughs> Red leather, yellow leather. Welcome back to The Dish. Up next, we have our TV correspondent, Nathaniel, who is going to be dishing out some Donald Trump news. Ew, politics, we know. Thanks, Aaron. Walking Dead fans rejoice. New teaser material has been released in anticipation for season six's finale. The latest, a photo of the villainous Negan, showcases some scintillating details about the sinister villain. For one, we know he has a signature barbed wire bat from the comics, and we also know what the back of his head looks like. 
Okay, so we all know everything, but AMC is just being difficult at this point. The teaser trailer hid his face, but we already know the face. It's Danny Duquette from Grey's Anatomy's face. What are they really hiding? Is it some surprise mustache that spoils the entire ending? Who knows? What we do know is The Walking Dead Season 6 finale premieres this Sunday, and all of our facial hair-related questions will finally be answered. FCC wants to investigate Netflix for throttling you. The streaming service is under fire from one particular member of commission after Netflix disclosed that it lowers, or throttles as he put it, the streaming quality on its mobile platform to help users stay under their monthly data limits. Oh really Netflix? It's for my own good? That's how you want to play it? Well, you don't get to decide when I watch The Muppet Show, or The Muppet Take Manhattan, or Fraggle Rock. I, I really enjoy Jim Henson's work, okay? Point is Netflix. Don't get between me and the 1975 classic, The Muppet Movie, okay? <laughs> hey, cable news stations, want a way to compete with streaming services like Netflix and Amazon? Just show more of our democratic system self-imploding. Tuesday night's Republican town hall was the most viewed in history, with ratings peaking when TV darling Donald Trump sat down to be interviewed. Viewers across this great nation tuned in to watch the Republican frontrunner talk about what apparently mattered to them most, like whether, like, his hand size or whether or not I started it. And, and is Donald Trump actually five years old? It really is inspiring to see so many viewers tuning in to become more informed on the great debates of our time. Daredevil Season 2 has arrived on Netflix, bringing the same superhero action and intrigue we expect from the series, but now with even more ninjas. John Bernthal, a.k.a. Shane from The Walking Dead, plays the Punisher, an angry, violent so psychopath with a troubled history with marriage, so we know he's staying in his range. And Charlie Cox returns to play the titular, the titular blind superhero who can actually see better than most. Not really sure how that works? Well, binge watch some Daredevil on Netflix and get back to us. And speaking of the Marvel show, I have a bone to pick about it. Daredevil is back and it's fine. Maybe I'm just spoiled after Jessica Jones, but am I the only one who gets a major sense of deja vu when I watch this show? All of his characters are, are people we've seen before. The comic relief best friend who isn't funny, the pretty female assistant, and don't even get me started on Daredevil himself. A dark, brooding, orphan superhero who roams the streets at night in a scary-looking costume, sitting atop buildings, fighting criminals, and using stealth and martial arts? A strict no-kill policy? Blind as a bat? Who does that remind you of? <laughs> at least season two is an improvement upon season one, because it actually has some fun with itself, and the introductions of the Punisher and Elektra breathe some fresh life into the show. But it still bothers me Daredevil's friends can't figure out that he's Daredevil. Hey, Matt Murdock, have you heard of that new superhero who fights crime at night and wears a mask that covers his eyes? How does he see? Isn't that weird, mysteriously buff, buff blind guy who's always been inexplicably covered in injuries since Daredevil showed up? Huh, I wonder what happened. You know, I forgot this show. Go rewatch Jessica Jones instead. Would you believe me if I told you that, that Fox is an amazing, clever sitcom and they didn't cancel it? It's true. Brooklyn Nine-Nine is wrapping up its third season and it's as fun as ever. It's from the writers of Parks and Rec and it's tonally very similar. The best part of the show is Andre Brower's character, the stoic police chief, Captain Holt. There have been a lot of gay characters in media recently, but Holt's one of the only ones I can think of where him being gay is never the punchline, it's just part of who he is. In fact, Brooklyn Nine-Nine has a refreshingly ethnically diverse cast, but they never get a ton of credit for it, and I think it's because they don't make a big deal about it, where other shows like, I don't know, Modern Family, spend most of their jokes being like, whoa, look at how all these people aren't white or straight. Brooklyn Nine-Nine give these characters identity beyond that, Captain Holt is gay, and it comes up a lot, but you wouldn't refer to him as the gay one. Anyway, I'm going to go watch The Muppets. Back to you, Aaron. <laughs> Thanks, Nathaniel. I'm going to miss your passion for TV and your hatred for the new Muppet series. It's almost scary how much you love TV. And now to the late, get the latest scoop on Boston-related entertainment news. I'm with Matt Jewell from Boston Magazine. He's here to tell us the latest in entertainment news. Thank you so much yeah, for being no with problem, us. No problem. Um, so how long have you been with Boston Magazine? I've been there since September, so, you know, going on a year. Okay. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, awesome. 
Uh, and I, I know that you mainly do uh, digital A and E. Yeah. But your articles have a, lo a lot of range, really. I was looking yeah. through some of them, and you cover a lot of political uh, events, some news. What, what other things have you been working on? So yeah, far? I've done everything from sports to business, uh, <laughs> but my focus is really entertainment. Okay. So yeah, it's my. Um, First thing I want to talk about really is the uh, Batman vs. Superman oh, yeah. movie. I know you have a lot of opinions uh, on Definitely. this, uh, especially considering some of the less than positive reviews. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This movie, uh, you, know, you know, like you were saying before, it's not really Ben Affleck's fault that this right. movie is pretty terrible, which it is. It's pretty awful. <laughs> um, I think my, uh, a friend of mine described it best. Uh, you know, the fault really goes on Zack Snyder. And he compared him to, you know, if, uh, M. Night Shyamalan and Michael Bay had a baby. <laughs> so that's pretty much what you should expect from yeah. this film. And, you know, um, I, you know, I kind of like that the actors aren't getting all the, uh, all the blame for this yeah. because, you know, so much of the time we give them too, too much credit, I think. I think yeah. in, when something goes good, it's the same thing. I mm -hmm. mean, um, there, there's so many people who support the talent in any project, uh, even The Dish. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But yeah. um, moving on um, to another topic that's a little closer to home, yeah. um, you, Boston Marathon, obviously a very big topic Definitely. here, and um, I, there's two big movies coming out with uh, big actors, huge movies. Uh, huge movies, Patriot's Day yeah. with uh, Mark Wahlberg, yeah, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, and then there's um, oh, I'm the Stronger. Stronger, thank you, with mm -hmm. uh, Jake Gyllenhaal. Yeah. Um, do you think these movies are going to hit too close to home? I, uh, personally, I think it's a little bit too soon for these films. Uh, I do believe that these films are in the right hands. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're going to put a, a Boston movie out there, uh, you, you, don't, you don't get more Boston than Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> right. Uh, and he's got a great cast around him. You know, they just announced Kevin Bacon and Michelle Monaghan and you know John Goodman, J.K. Mm -hmm. Simmons. So it's a really great cast. And, and with Stronger, it's a little different film. It's more on uh, you know one of the survivors, uh, Jeff Bauman, mm -hmm. um, and, and Jake Gyllenhaal. He's a great actor, so I really don't see him you know messing this one right. up. Right, and obviously this is a sensitive subject with yeah. so many people uh, being affected by it. So exactly. hopefully they'll be res be responsible with that. Yeah, um, I think they've been respectful. So yeah. Far. Well, we'll we'll have to <laughs> see. Um, and another thing, you recently mm. interviewed Tim Gunn. Yes. Uh, how was that? That was great. He, he's a great guy, very funny guy, obviously, if you've ever seen any of his uh, work on Project Runway. And oh, I have, I have. <laughs> yeah. And he's been in town, though, pushing this uh, bill that is going to uh, legalize industrial uh, mm -hmm. hemp, which, of course, is used in a lot of different things, from building cars to buildings uh, to, to more in his vein. You can use it for textiles and making clothes. And, and it was a big part of this industry back, you know, way before the, you know, the days where we thought weed would make you jump out of buildings. Right. And, uh, you know, this has nothing to do with that. You know, you can smoke a Christmas tree and get higher. So, <laughs> so it, I think it's a great thing that he's doing. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, and I really, you know, it's telling because, like you said, there's less uh, than 3% of THC exactly. in uh, cannabis, as far uh, hemp, excuse me, mm -hmm. and most marijuana strains have a lot more. Well, uh, thank you so much yeah. for being with us today. The, uh, this was Matt Jewell. And anyway, we'll go to our movie correspondent, Aiden, who has some stories for us. Thanks, Aaron. A film adaptation of the Jeanette Walls memoir, Glass Castle, booted Jennifer Lawrence from the lead role and replaced her with Brie Larson, proving that once a young blonde girl wins an Oscar, she is already much more important than the other young blonde girls who also recently won Oscars. They've also added Naomi Watts to play Larson's mother and Woody Harrelson to play her father. Naomi Watts seems a little young to play Larson's mother, but hey, that's classic Hollywood. Who wants to see a woman of age on screen? But old dudes? Hell yeah, they're great! That's why Daniel Day-Lewis has so many trophies. Pixar released images of some of the new characters that will be seen in Finding Dory, the sequel to Finding Nemo. Nemo. Some of the new characters include an octopus named Hank, a whale shark named Destiny, a beluga named Bailey, and a very, very, very cute pack of otters. Like, seriously. They are so cute, I need to figure out how I can make animated characters pets. Ed O'Neill and Ty Burrell are some of the new voices in the film, so whether or not it's just an underwater episode of Modern Family is still up in the air. The trailer for Mother's Day, one of those crazy movies that focuses on a bunch of white people during a holiday, like Valentine's Day or New Year's Eve, was recently released. Considering the amount of people who make fun of films in this genre, I really don't know how Mother's Day became a thing, but it did. And the trailer looks just how you'd expect. It's jam-packed with celebrities like Julia Roberts, Jennifer Aniston, Kate Hudson, and Jason Sudeikis. It really makes me wonder how bored these people get. Like all movies, this film has a promotional Twitter account. 
But it's not at Mother's Day or at Mother's Day movie. It's at Sea Mother's Day. So it's literally pleading for people to show up. <laughs> and it isn't even being released on Mother's Day weekend. Nothing about this movie makes sense to me. If you're a Star Wars fan looking to plan a vacation, we have some great travel tips for you. All Nippon Airways recently made a three Star Wars planes that are ready for commercial takeoff. One is painted to look like everyone's favorite new droid, BB-8, another like R2-D2, and the other one has the Star Wars logo and a picture of BB-8 on it. Honestly, I don't think I'm going anywhere anymore unless I get to travel in a, a themed airplane. Make sure you get a window seat by the wing to get a sick Instagram pic. And now in the review world, I got a serious one for you. Two weeks ago, Netflix released what someone in this world might argue was the most highly anticipated movie of the decade. That movie, Pee-wee's Big Holiday. If you're unfamiliar with the wild, wacky, and sometimes creepy adventures of the eccentric man-child Pee-wee Herman, then I'm forced to ask, where the hell were you in 1985 when Pee-wee's Big Adventure came out? You know, the feature that linked film directed by no-name Tim Burton, or maybe you know him from the wildly popular, artistic, yet educational children's series, Pee-wee's Playhouse or possibly from his 1991 arrest for indecent exposure at an adult film house. And let's be honest here, he probably didn't deserve to be arrested for that. Even actor and comedian Bill Cosby was quoted defending Pee Wee saying, whatever he's done, this is being blown all out of proportion. Wait a minute. <laughs> Neither here nor there. After 28 years of anticipation for his next feature length movie, Pee Wee Herman is back. But is he better than ever? Pee-wee's Big Holiday was produced by Judd Apatow and co-written by Pee-wee, also known as Paul Rubens, and Paul Rust. He's the guy who stars in the new Netflix series, Love. The plot, of course, follows Pee-wee Herman, a much-loved resident from the small town of Fairville. In this film, Pee-wee works as a cook at Dan's Diner, and he's never once left Fairville or tried anything new. On one particularly bad day, Pee-wee meets the coolest guy he's ever seen, actor Joe Manganiello playing himself. The two instantly form a great friendship and Joe Manganiello convinces Pee Wee to take his first vacation outside of Fairville to celebrate Joe's birthday at his penthouse in New York City. The rest of this movie consists of Pee Wee's adventure and struggles in order to get there. If you're a big Pee Wee Herman fan, you might want to check this movie out, but if you're not, I wouldn't put it at the top of your priorities. There are certainly some funny moments and jokes that reference older films, but a lot of the pacing seemed to be a little bit off, and uh, I kept thinking it seemed like a very toned-down version of Pee-wee's Big Adventure. They tried to keep some of the creepiness and weirdness of that movie in there, but it didn't fully click with me. If you're ever in the mood to watch something that's just kind of silly and light, and maybe you'll enjoy it, but it's not for everyone. Now, that's all I have to say about that. If you need me, I'll be re-watching all five se seasons. Seaweeds. A Pee-wee's Playhouse. <laughs> Back to you, Aaron. <sighs> Thanks, Hayden. This is the second time you've been on the show, and I'm honestly scared you might take my job away from me. Damn, he's good. We're going to take a short commercial break, and we'll see you soon. Good morning, Emerson, of course. Good morning, Emerson? What's that? Uh, it's the best morning show ever that's on Tuesday and Thursday at 9 a.m. Wow, how, can I work on this? Yeah, let's get going. <laughs> Red leather, yellow leather.
<laughs> thank you, thank you. Welcome back. I'm glad you're still here. Uh, let's send it over to Danny, who has some music news for us. Thanks, Aaron. Miley Cyrus will be joining the judges panel for the new season of The Voice this fall. I'm hoping she brings her full wardrobe team along. Every time those chairs turn around, I expect to be floored. Not by what she's wearing, nothing would surprise me anymore. But maybe they can do a number for some of the other hosts. Blake Shelton in a bubble wrap bikini? Sweltering. <laughs> Snoop Dogg is this year's WWE Hall of Fame celebrity inductee. He will be joining a prestigious line of inductees including Donald Trump, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Drew Carey? Really? I'm just glad Snoop is finally getting the respect he deserves after his many years playing the noble sport, winning an incredible one matches. What really grinds my gears is that people online are showing no respect for the man. Commenters on the WWE homepage are really questioning if someone who smokes that much weed is able to even comprehend the art of wrestling. Cut the man some slack. WWE isn't real and Snoop can do whatever he wants. Also, if Donald Trump can make it in the Hall of Fame, anyone can. Don Cheadle, a.k.a. War Machine from Avengers, has taken a serious chill pill to become the first person ever to play jazz trumpeter Miles Davis on the big screen. The film Miles Ahead tells the life story of the man who's said to have invented cool, even though we all know that LL Cool J invented cool. I mean, come on, it's in his name. Miles Ahead isn't really a biopic, though. It's more like Pulp Fiction jammed with Moulin Rouge with a bit more funk, the kind of movie, as Cheadle says, Miles would want to be in. But I'm not sure if Miles would necessarily want to split the bill with Ewan McGregor. McGregor's playing a totally fictional Rolling Stone reporter because Cheadle felt he couldn't get the movie financed without a white co-star. Seriously? White people love Miles Davis. He plays smooth jazz for crying out loud. But hey, whatever gets you Oscar nods, am I right? Definitely not an all-black cast. And a historic thawing of relations between Cuba and the world of capitalism. The Rolling Stones played a free concert in Havana on Sunday. It was the first international rock and roll performance in Cuba ever, though it wasn't quite as much like Footloose as it could have been. Cuba is short on balloons, so the crowd bounced around inflated condoms. What a way to bring Cuba back to the West, watching Mick Jagger shake what the good Lord gave him. Ah, Mick. U2 is planning the follow-up album to Songs of Innocence, which was forcibly placed in thousands of people's iTunes library, whether they liked it or not. They currently have about 50 ideas for the new record, says guitarist The Edge. These may or may not include forcing the whole world to go on an Easter egg hunt with nothing but the album in each egg. Larry Mullen, the band's drummer, is reported to have said, guys, can't we just sell it? To which Bono and The Edge said, shut up, Larry. You don't have a cool name. <laughs> and now on to a review. Rivers Cuomo, frontman and founder of Weezer, is forever alternative rock's estranged dad trying desperately to reconnect with his children. Every couple years we get a release from Weezer, hyped as a return to their roots, but they've never quite managed to recapture that magic of the first two albums. And if you've been following the nerdy power pop group as long as I have, you're not surprised that this new album can't touch the classics. However, the White Album, released today, does offer a refreshing break from the musical equivalents of dad jokes we've been getting from them lately. While their last release talked about how they wanted to go back to their old sound, the White Album actually delivers this promise. The opening track, California Kids, is a throwback to the sunny beach pop sound of their debut Blue Album, while Do You Want to Get High sounds so much like a cut from their 96 Teen Inks masterpiece Pinkerton that it could have been an outtake from that album. If you're a fan of classic Weezer, at least give this album a chance. Take that fishing trip with Dad, and who knows, maybe you'll find a couple things you have in common. Back to you, Aaron. <laughs> Thanks, Danny. What I'll miss about you most is your liking of smooth jazz. It's such a great characteristic of your personality. Lindsay has got some theater news for us next. Lindsay? Thanks, Aaron. Arthur Miller's The Crucible, or that one play your high school English teacher really wanted to let you know was about McCarthyism, is back on Broadway with all new experimental digs. Starring Ben Wizaw and Sal, so, share. That Girl from Brooklyn, takes the, the revival takes Arthur Miller's canonical piece about the Salem witch trials of the 1700s and has it take place in a classroom in like present day, I think? Whatever. The super weird interpretation of a classic play is directed by Ivo von Hoven, a name 99.7% of the people watching this program don't know. But he's apparently the directing boy wonder of the theater scene. He's just come off directing another re revival of The View from the Bridge and the David Bowie musical Black Star. So this guy's kind of a big deal. 
The play is running until July 17th, so if you're in New York and want to be confused and intrigued at the same time, head on down to the Walter Kerr Theater and check it out. Dante's Inferno for Kids, more commonly known as Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, is crossing the pond from London to Broadway for production in spring 2017. The Roald Dahl adaption has gotten mixed reviews overseas, presumably because it's a disturbing kids show about murdering children in a candy factory, but also because the songs are just kind of meh. But because the show is making mucho pounds overseas, we're going to have to suffer through watching serial killer in candy colored suit torture naughty children for sport. I mean, come on, guys, that's what the book's about. Willy Wonka is killing them. Augustus Gloop would suffocate in those pipes. Nobody turns into a blueberry and lives to tell the tale. <laughs> While there hasn't been an official cast announcement yet, I'm betting on Anthony Hopkins for the role of Willy the Skinner Wonka. Because let's face it, we've all seen him play Hannibal the Cannibal. I want to see him play Hannibal the Cannibal. Tired of having to purchase multiple original Broadway cast recordings in order to listen to your favorite Broadway bangers? Tired of the struggle of having to type out the name of the show tune you want to listen to on the Spotify search bar? Want to try some listening to something that isn't the Hamilton soundtrack? Well, then don't throw away your shot and pick up a copy of Now That's What I Call Broadway. I wish I was joking. The mix CD in institution that should have died with the invention of iTunes is compiling all of your favorite Broadway bangers from all of your favorite shows that aren't Hamilton, such as Rent and Wicked and, ugh, Cats. Now that's what I call music. Why is why that's why, what I call music still a thing? Who thought it was a good idea? Why did they have to include cats? <laughs> And if you thought that we would have an episode of The Dish where we didn't talk about Hamilton, congratulations, you're a dummy. The little show that's really as good as everyone says it is recently took a trip to the White House to perform selections of a show for a number of high schoolers who are probably the luckiest high schoolers of all time. I mean, I don't know what's going on in their real lives, but considering that the show is sold out until Donald Trump starts running for his second term as president, they've got it pretty much made. The students got to ask Lin-Manuel Miranda and his merry band of revolutionary classmates all about their creative process in American history and how to make Lindsay Young extremely jealous. Seriously, I'm happy for these kids and all, but the most exciting thing that happened to me in high school was having a birthday party magician do some tricks at an assembly. <laughs> these kids met the cast of Hamilton. I don't even know how to process all of this. Emerson Stage's New Fest New Works Festival will finish the month-long festival with We Are a Pussy Riot, a new play by Barbara Hammond about the radical feminist punk group Pussy Riot, who were arrested for public protest in Russia in 2012. The group calls for the separation of church and state, equality for all people of Russia, including women and LGBTQ, and the opposition of Vladimir Putin. The show is a completely new play and is directed by Kenneth Prestoninzi, girls wearing Balakavas and bright colors direct audiences into the theater and encourage them to join in on their fight against the patriarchy. A radical, political, and topical show, the workshopped play makes audiences draw connections between the political mess that Russia is in and the very similar path we're going down. Although, to be fair, a game of what would you rather between Trump and Putin doesn't sound like much fun to me. The show is more than just a punk group putting on a play. It's a wonderful group of people really making you think. Back to you, Aaron. Well, that just about does it for this season of The Dish. Thank you so much to everyone that's worked on the show. To our seniors who are leaving us for the scary real world, bye bye and don't say we didn't warn you. To our viewers, see you next season where, I'm not revealing any major dish secrets here, but next season, we're getting a dog! Thanks for watching. Yeah. <laughs>